Hello, my name is Rick Pearson and this is Prophecy USA, a program specifically designed to unveil the hidden mystery of America's role in Bible prophecy. Have you ever wondered if there's anything you should be doing to prepare for the rapture? Well, stay tuned because you're about to find out. Welcome back, folks. Last week, we were interviewed by my dear friend, Pastor Billy Richards, and I shared with Pastor Billy over 30 descriptions of Babylon the Great and how America meets every description. However, in our 30th description, we found out that God's people were literally within Babylon, and God warns them, come out of her, my people, that ye be not partaker of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues, for her sins have reached unto heaven. Now at that point, Pastor Billy asked me a very pertinent question that directly affects all of us who believe that America is truly in the Bible. So let's go back now to Church on the Queensway as we search the scriptures to not only find out what the Bible says, but hear direct warnings that Jesus gave to those of us who believe. And you are there. I want to get back to what you just said about God's people because I wrote this down and I want to ask you this, okay? According to Jeremiah 51, 14, I believe it is, and Revelations 19, verse 4, she, Babylon, has God's people inside her. How does the Babylon fall in the darkness affects God's people? Like when Babylon, the Bible says it falls in the darkness. Talk to me about God's people. Okay. Um Babylon means confusion. We in the church, we are followers of Christ, are supposed to go out of the church and give the gospel and affect them. But what happens in Babylon, the confusion gets into the church. Mm -hmm. Instead of the church setting the stage for the moral protocol, the culture sets the moral protocol for the church and she falls away. It's the falling away of the church, of those that are in Babylon. And Jesus warned in the book of Revelation, two, chapters 2 and 3, seven distinct groups of believers that would fall away, and he rebukes. Now, two of the seven are in good standing with God, but there's five of them that Jesus said, these sins have so easily beset you, and he warns them. He warns the believers within Babylon of the sins that so easily beset them, and, and basically they're, they're confused. Instead of them affecting Babylon, Babylon affects them. And that first group um, is, is the church of Ephesus. It's the, 31, the 31st description. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the the church of Ephesus is, a, is believers. And they're in every church. This isn't a domination. This isn't the Catholics or the Protestants or the Baptists or the uh, Pentecostals. Or, no. These are groups within the body of Christ, people who have relationship with God, and some have slipped away from God. And the first group he talks about is Ephesus. And in Ephesus... He says, I have somewhat against thee because you have left your first love. These folks maybe are Christian, but God isn't first in their life. And here's, here's a perfect example, Billy. Um, if a man is sitting in a boat and he's enjoying the nature and the atmosphere and he's thinking about God and he's thanking him, and another man is sitting in church and he's thinking about fishing. Who's closest to God? Right. Who is closest to God? God's supposed to go with you wherever you go. You need to be God conscious in what you say, in how you treat people, in how you do business. But this group comes to church 
and they do their thing, but when they walk out of the church, they forget about God. They've right. lost their first love. And then there's a second group called Sardis. And he says, I know your works, and thou hast a name, uh, but I have not found thy works perfect before God. Now these folks, they're in the church, but they're not working with God. Their works are not ordained by God. Now it says in, in um, Ephesians 6 that you're supposed to, when you work for a master, you work for him as unto Christ. In other words, you treat him just like you serve him, just like you're serving Christ. But these people go do a job, but they're not serving others as you would serving Christ. So you could be, uh, a dead work would be working for someone, and you're really not, you're, you're, get, you're, you're trying to get away with as much as possible and not work. You're not really serving that person. You're not doing it from the heart as unto God. Now that's what I consider dead works. And then it warns the masters, the bosses, you better treat those people as if they were Christ and you don't, you don't rule your people and, and you treat them fairly. You're going to be judged by how you treat others. So the works that you're doing, it doesn't necessarily working in the church, but working daily with people, you treat everybody the way you would treat Christ, whether you're serving coffee whether you're working on their car as a mechanic, but God consciousness, it, it runs a parallel with, um, with Ephesus. You have a God consciousness in everything that you do. And then that God consciousness gets in your hands and you serve people. And then the, there's a third group called Smyrna. And Smyrna is um, a persecuted church. Now, these folks are doing all the right things, but they're being persecuted for it. First, it all starts with verbal persecution. Now, over in Afghan right now, Afghanistan, they're cutting people's heads off. Uh, they're putting people, they're putting Christians in jail in China. That is heavy-duty persecution. I don't know if that's going to come here or not. I doubt it. But we still will have verbal persecution if we're going to walk this walk and be an ambassador of this kingdom. You're going to have some persecution. And that's the church of Smyrna, the believers. Uh, now there's, there's one other um, group here, and it's called Pergamos. And uh, it's the fourth group, the fourth group of believers. Um, I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. Now this is where the moral protocol of Babylon gets into church. All of a sudden you have people in church and they're committing fornication, they're committing adultery, Jesus will forgive me, and they're really not walking the walk. Babylon, the confusion of our culture has gotten into them. And Jesus actually addresses this. And he says, so also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which I hate. Now, this Pergamos, the, the Nicolaitans, is talking about leadership. Nicholas was uh, a deacon in the church of Antioch. And he got saved. Uh, he, first of all, he was pagan. Then he became a Jew. Then he became a Christian. But he introduced pagan idolatry into the church and had the believers doing a lot of things like committing sexual immorality, and he said it was okay. Now the word Nicolaitan, Nico, means conquer, and Laos means laity. This church is referring to leadership in the church that's telling their people it's okay to do all these things. It's a Nicolaitan church. They're, they're coming against the book of protocol. They're not lining up their lifestyle with what this book says to do. And Jesus warns them. And this is right before he's coming. Before he comes to rapture the church, he's speaking to all these believers and he's saying, don't do this. Because something very terrible is coming and you want to get your life and get yourself ready for what's coming. There's another church called Thyatira. 
Now it runs close with Pergamos. And in, in Thyatira, it says, You suffer that woman Jezebel, which called herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. I'll give her space to repent of her fornication, but she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation. Except they repent of their deeds. And then it says, I will kill her children with death. Hmm. Now Jezebel, Jezebel was the queen uh, in Israel with Ahab, and she introduced Baal worship. She wanted everybody to, to be involved in Baal worship. And Baal worship basically um, is sexual immorality. And if you get pregnant, you bring your, your, your baby to the god of Moloch and you sacrifice him. And if you sacrifice your baby to the god of Moloch, Moloch will bless you financially. So Jezebel represents what's happening in our nation with regards to abortion. It's the Jezebel spirit that gets into the church. And now you have church leaders that are for abortion. And they say, we love women. You can, you can do whatever you want to with your child. And that represents a Jezebel spirit in the church of Thyatira. So we have all of these things now, all of these believers and churches, we have all of this happening right now in re real time. We have major denominations splitting over the gay, the, the gay marriage. We have major denominations splitting over the abortion issue. We have major denominations that are not preaching that there's a hell to shun and a heaven to gain. There's people preaching now that there is no hell. The sixth church that we're going to look at is Laodicea. And this is where 95% of the Christians will find themselves. In fact, I'm going to say 90% of the Christians. It says to the church of Laodicea. Now, these are the richest believers in the history of the world. Do you know that the average person in church in North America is, is basically has more than Solomon had? Solomon did not have air conditioning. He didn't have climate control. He didn't have a car. He didn't have a cell phone. He didn't have a microwave oven. He didn't have a flush toilet. We in North America are the richest believers in the history of the world. And that's another sign that we're living in Babylon. Because Jesus talked to the Laodiceans and they had a problem with money. He says, because you say I'm rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, Knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked? I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed. Now, all through the Old Testament, you have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they're all giving their first fruits offerings to God. And the first fruits is the, is the uh, first 10%. And that money went to help the widows, um, help, the, help the children that didn't have parents, help the poor. And God would, would, would put this on them to give their first 10% to the kingdom so God could do work and bless others. The church of Laodicea says that she's rich within herself, but she hasn't distributed that wealth. She's not giving, she's not giving her first fruits. And Jesus says, I will vomit you out of my mouth. And then he says, if you want to get right with me. Now, this is what I did. Billy, I have never taken a tithe in my life. I have never received a tithe. But I have given tithes. I've given to this church, to this mission, missions project, uh, to this. I support some missionaries. Wherever God tells me to give my money is where I give my first fruits. So I'm not, I'm not preaching this to get from people, but I'm telling you that your money is extremely important in the last days before the rapture comes because Jesus addresses it right here. Now, you would not be getting this revelation and this teaching if I had not given 10% of my substance and said, here, God, whatever you want. And I, and I used that money. I gave it towards a medical mission for third world uh, countries where o ORU had medical missions project. And that money went out to help people. I don't even know who they are. 
but I gave it unto God. The church of Laodicea, about 90% of the people in the church today do not tithe. They do not give their first fruits. Now, I'm not saying you have to give your first fruits, but I'm just saying there's a principle here that you have to pray about because you have to look what you're doing with your money and are you part of the Laodicean church that says, I'm rich, I'm increased with goods, and I have need of nothing? And Jesus said, you're wretched. Then he says, I counsel thee to buy of me. That word is agarazo. It literally means, it literally means to redeem or to pay, to cough it up. <laughs> That's what I did when I was 32. I was holding on to God's ties, and I had to cough it up and something happened spiritually to me. He says, buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou may be as rich and white raiment and thou mayest be clothed. Now this is very important when we come to the final church, the silver lining, the church of Philadelphia. Remember, here we are coming. We're in the seventh nation. The eighth nation has not come yet. We st- she the seventh nation has not been deposed yet. So this is, this is all talking to us right now in real time, Christians, the church, and the different things we need to get in order before the rapture takes place. You've done six churches. The seventh one, help me here, what is it? The seventh church is, this, is the silver lining, Billy. This is the silver lining in all these churches. Right. The silver lining says, it's the church of Philadelphia. It says, I know your works. He's happy with the works. Behold, I've set before thee an open door that no man can shut. For thou hast little strength and hast kept my word. You know, the church of Philadelphia has not followed the herd. They followed the word. They haven't been influenced by the Babylonian confusion. They haven't been... They haven't been kicked aside by the, by the persecution, by the name calling, they stuck with the word and there's a reward coming to them. Because you have kept the word of my patience, I will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world and try them that dwell upon the earth. That's the 39th description of Babylon. She has people in her who are going to be delivered from the judgment that's coming when Babylon is deposed. Because they have kept God's word. They have kept morally clean before him. They've, they've, they've worked and done works with people and they've did it as unto Christ. They're honest, hard workers, love God. Uh, they've given tithes and offerings. They've, give, they've worshiped God with their first fruits. And God says, stay, just st- keep with me. I know you have little strength, but I have an open door for you that no man can shut. Okay, so this guy is at home, and he's drinking a cup of coffee, and he has no idea what you're talking about. What is the silver lining? What's the open door? Okay, the, the silver lining is the rapture of the church. Now, that's when the, the catching away... Um, It says after Babylon is judged that the voice of the bride and the bridegroom will be heard no more at all in her. Okay, now this guy at home, you're introducing a couple concepts he might not understand. Who's the bride? Who's the bridegroom? Okay, the bride and the bridegroom is, uh, Jesus said that I go away to prepare a place for you. And when I come, I will take you with me. This is called the rapture of the church. It's a supernatural exodus that takes place with the open door in the church of Philadelphia. I provide an open door that no man can shut so that you are worthy to escape the things that are coming. Right. This is the tribulation period that's coming is going to be absolutely terrible. It's going to be terrible. It's a world without God. So the believers who are following the, the belief of Philadelphia, who have held true to God's word, who haven't crumbled and all this stuff, they're going to be raptured, taken up to be with the Lord. Yes. So we're not going to go through the tribulation? 
Some will go through and some will not. Jesus said in Luke 21, pray that you might be worthy to escape. If you don't do a checkup from the neck up, yeah. you get into this book, Jesus warns all seven believers. Here's the things to watch for. Are you involved in any immorality? Don't think you're going up. If you're, if, you're not, if you're not walking clean with me and my mind is in your mind, if, you're, if your language is foul and you're a Christian, you've got some work to do. Now, the work of the cross, our salvation is a gift. When Jesus died on the cross, all we have to do is ask him into our hearts. And we are saved through his forgiveness. But when it comes to the rapture, it says, pray that you might be counted worthy. So that tells me that there's some people worthy and others that aren't. In other words, the, re the rapture is a reward for following his word. And for those who aren't following his word, they're going to get a chance on the other side of the rapture to follow his word. And it's going to be a lot harder on the other side of the rapture than on this side of the rapture. Because people are going to be martyred on the other side of the rapture if they want Christian protocol in their life. There's two churches that Jesus does not rebuke. Who are they and why? The two churches he doesn't rebuke are Smyrna, who are suffering, and the other church is Philadelphia, who's keeping the word who's walking circumspectly before God, and uh, they're not following the herd. They're following the word. Um, you know, there's, there's warnings, too, uh, that Jesus gave. And, and this comes under the, I believe it's the 41st and 42nd description of Babylon. Jesus said in, in Luke 17, when, when, when will you be coming? And he says, it will be as in the days of Noah and in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, in the day of Sodom and Gomorrah, well, first of all, Noah. Noah was the man of the rainbow covenant, wasn't he? The rainbow was given from God to us to solidify that he would never judge the earth again by rain or by water. And it was the covenant that he gave us. A covenant between man and God. The covenant that he also cut with Abraham. The covenant that he gave with uh, Israel. If you obey my voice, these things will happen. Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 15. So this is, the rainbow is, 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 is a covenant. He also said it would be as the days of Noah, but also as the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, in Sodom and Gomorrah, what they had was an angel was released. It went to Lot, two of them. They went to Lot, and they told Lot, God is going to judge Sodom and Gomorrah. There's going to be an urban renewal program in the next day that's going to blow you away. So the angels, were, or the, the angels that came stayed with Lot, and the men of Sodom saw the angel, and it said they wanted to know them. And Lot said, here, take my daughters. Take my daughters, they're virgins, and you can know them. Know is carnal knowledge. Mm -hmm. And they said, no, no, no. We want the men. And, and uh, Lot said, D please don't do this, don't do this. And the people of Sodom said, who are you to tell us what we can and can't do? We'll do worse to you than what we'll do to them. You know what? They thought that Lot was judging them, but they actually were judging Lot. And the Bible says in Matthew 7, judge not lest ye be judged, for with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured unto you. We're not supposed to judge others, but if we do, that will be measured unto us. And that's just like gravity. That's for believers and non-believers. When people judge you, for being a Christian, God will judge them. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, it's a two-edged sword. So the last night that 
Sodom existed, they had men marching down the street, militant with their sexuality, demanding other people to join them, and if they didn't, they were judging them, and they were harassing them, and they were uh, bullying them. Now, today we have gay parades, and we have the rainbow in our society does not stand for the covenant between God and man. It stands for the new sexual liberation. This is in a covenant nation, Billy. This is in a nation that says in God we trust. This is in a nation that, that has that on their money and says one nation under God. And yet, we're defying everything that God says to do. This is what Jesus said it would be like immediately before he come. He came. And this is what we see in our society right now. This is what David Wilkerson prophesied for in 1987. He said, this is what's coming. This is what the Lord showed me was coming. And I could hardly believe the things that I was being shown and what was coming. Now that I'm here and I'm on television and I'm teaching this, everybody can see what I'm saying because it's happening in real time. It's very easy to look at these 53 points and say, you know, I think America's in the Bible because yeah. she's meeting all this criteria. So um, I, we, are, we are right there now, 41, this woman... In, in Jeremiah 51, 30, it says that God will judge Babylon as he did overthrow Sodom and Gomorrah. So if we are Babylon the Great, we have to have a moral protocol that's just like Sodom and Gomorrah. And we have to have, we have, to have visibly the rainbow flag because it was as in the days of Noah. So here we are. Those are two more signs that we are in the Bible and it's happening in real time. Babylon has fallen, fallen, become the habitation of every foul and unclean spirit. Welcome back, folks. I trust you've enjoyed our interview with Pastor Billy Richards. And please feel free to join us every Thursday at 7 p.m. for our Bible study podcast and live chat where we answer many questions from you, our viewing audience. We'd also like to thank those of you who are supporting us with your prayers and finances. Without your help, we could never distribute this timely prophetic word that the Lord has given us in the last days. And we just pray that God will bless you and keep you and shine his face upon you in every area of your life, in your laughter, in your leisure, in your victories, and in your tears. Until that day when we see him smile upon us and know that the battle is over and the victory is ours in Jesus' name. This is Prophecy USA. My name's Rick Pearson, and we're reminding you that Jesus Christ is alive and he's coming back much sooner than many people realize. See you next week. Shalom.